to it um 2019 marks um the 55th anniversary of the the formation and, and the the launching of herman's hermits um what do you think about that number 55 when you what, is, what 55 since when uh it's i guess 55 years since the band formed like the the, mu- um, the music it says 63 okay, so 64 the- but yeah, I think 63 was more like it. You know, wait, wait a second, let's see, Pino, maybe 62. Okay. Well, I guess... That's okay, 57 years is fabulous. It's fabulous. What do you think about that when you apply it to the to, to the road that you've been on to the here and now of of um, that music itself and, and what you've done in your life? I, th- I think it's pretty... Um, you know, I was always a persistent little guy. And uh, from the beginning until now, I'm still persistent and pushy and let's do it this way and let's go here and let's do that. You know, so I, that's what happens, I think, to persistent little shits like me. <laughs> but does that mean, yeah. uh, does, does, that, does that also explain about the ambition you had at such a young age? I mean, you were an actor before you were a musician. Well, you know, I was an actor to get the money to be uh, a musician. You know, in those, day, in those days, you, a band was like a hobby. You got some friends together and you went and played in the local youth clubs because you couldn't play in a pub because you weren't 18. And you played in any place that, you, that would have you, you know, like your sister's hairdressers, upstairs, engagement party, everything. We did everything right from the be- very beginning. And we, I still think I've got 10 more years. Would, that would make it 67 years <laughs> we'd have this phone call. Well, I always found it fascinating because... Um you know, nowadays it's a different story, but back then it, it seemed that, like you had said, it seemed like people looked at it as almost like a um, a novelty kind of thing. Like, oh, it's something you'll do for a couple well, of years only, and then get a and then get a quote unquote real job. It only works if you if you if, the, if it's a hobby as well. Yeah, I'm even a fan of airplanes, so you know that made that into. I went from trains to airplanes. And now I'm like a, tr- a plane spotter. So when I get on the plane, it's an exciting adventure. And, and you know, luckily for me, I, ha- I have experience and I know that there are no two concerts the same ever. Yeah. Even the guys in my band go, this is really weird. We, we never do the same thing ever. I said, well, that's not because it's not planned. It's because there isn't a plan. And that's the plan, not to have a plan. The plan is just to work as much as you can, do the best job you can on every gig, and be uh, respectful to everybody, and then go home and have a bath and then get ready to go for the next one. So I guess for you, though, I mean, it's one of those things where I would I would surmise that you are, you are not ever on autopilot when you do these shows, that this is, you take it very seriously uh, today as, as ever before. Well, it is, you know, and I have the advantage of, of having played the cavern, um, which was the worst place ever to, for any <laughs> band ever to play. Because there was a thing called condensation and people smoked and people sweated. Yeah. And it used to drip on you and it used to drip from the ceiling above the stage onto your face <laughs> or onto, worse, onto your hair and slowly go into your eyes. And that's the look on everyone's face there. They, you think they're smiling, but they're actually grimacing from the mix of nicotine and condensation, <laughs> a.k.a. sweat. Yeah. So, so I mean, the legendary cavern. Uh, so with that said, though, I mean, do you... Uh... What do you, what do you, what's, what, what do you remember most about those early days? I mean, it seemed like, you know, obviously the, the gate burst open when the, when the Beatles showed up, but... But what was it like in, in England at that point? I mean, was it really that much of a whirlwind that was starting to surface, or was it a slow burn to what happened when everything broke in the U.S.? You know, I I don't remember it being anything but fun. Yeah. It, it was, you remember, see, once you had, the Beatles grew up in the shadow of Elvis Presley. Yeah. And we grew up in the shadow of the Beatles. So we never really took ourselves that serious because we knew we were never going to be as good as the Beatles. So I know what we'll do. We won't compete with them. We'll do completely different types of songs. We'll go the Body Holly and the Crickets way and just find beautiful pop romantic songs. And 
and you know throw in some comedy we used to do we used to do my boy lollipop at the cavern <laughs> nobody else did that <laughs> no one else did my boy lollipop and we used to do mother-in-law 14 year old boy singing mother-in-law <laughs> is different so and we've always kept it like that you know i mean it's always been sometimes we do songs on stage that we don't even know yeah I always think too that you know a lot of the bands, including yourself, that came over um, in that time period following the Kennedy assassination, it almost seemed um, serendipitous that that this really happy and uplifting music showed up in such a dark time in America and the world at that point. Most of the songs that we brought here were American remakes, like yeah. "Sweets for My Sweets" by The Searchers was a drifter song, and and Love Potion Number Nine was a drifter's as coasters song, and and all we did was we were more enthusiastic because you had your John F. Kennedy, we had the World War that was on our doorstep. Yep. Every every single person in every band that was in the British invasion was connected to somebody who fought in the Second World War like my father fought and my mother was sent to the countryside because the place where she lived was being bombed they, of course there would be fun periods of music well it's of like when, 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 when you when you know you you read about um, the stories about how e even that many years after World War II about how uh, how much rubble and, and how much devastation was still physically and emotionally on the landscape of England and it was almost um, the pushback of that became the, these bands that had a very positive and uplifting sound. Garrett, what happened was some, everything was downsizing. It was a period of, they call it, now they call it austerity. Yeah. People had to make more with less. Yep. They had to make it work. And somebody had the brilliant idea to get rid of the trombone player get rid of the Hammond organ player, get rid of the girl singers, and I'll do the background vocals. And that was the Beatles, the Searchers, the Undertakers, the Dave Clark Band. They re replaced the big bands. And and it was because it was affordable. Yeah. And, and as you'll see, what happened is it's gone right back to having a big band, and they've even got fireworks in the show now as part <laughs> of it. Like, 15 dancers and fireworks and one day there'll be a period of austerity and some, we need to find a trio who can do the work of all these people. Well, it's funny you mention that because when I've talked to other musicians, I, I mentioned about how rock and roll, although it's always being created and, and sought after, it, it's mainly disappeared from the charts, but, but I, I think that it's kind of circled back to its underground rebellious nature now, uh, only to bubble back up at some point. Of course. You know, it's always been cyclical, you know, I mean, I, I can remember in, in, in my period, you, you got goes from, you know, people were like, you know, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, that, that's that period. Elvis Presley was the king of the rock and roll thing, which included Sam Cooke and Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard and Fat Domino. We'll give it then the first top five of that period, right? And then after that, it was the Beatles and all the people that you want to put along with the Beatles. Then probably it was Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, that yeah. little cyclical period. And then after that, it all got a bit wishy-washy. You can say Journey and everything. But all during that period, all we got was the Spice Girls, yeah. who got girls back at girls back in the record store. You know, got, oh, I want to dress like any girls. Yeah. And, and not boys. And then Nirvana. And if you can, if you can tell me... If you can name three people from any period since Nirvana, I, I have a go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, go on, I'd, I'd love to hear if you, can, if you can come up with two or three names. I would like to know what the period is that I've missed. In terms of rock and roll? In terms of the, getting people interested in the next album. The, there's uh, up top of my head uh, worldwide I could say Radiohead's definitely one of them um, me too okay there you go that, See, but is it is it a period that, that's the only per, that's the only person you could come up with and, and I came up with like six from the 50s yeah. seven from the 60s and nine from the 70s in terms of definitely bands that people um, like 
it's a big deal when the album comes out. They're one of worldwide them and maybe the Foo Fighters, but even the Foo Fighters, you have two members of Nirvana in that band. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean? Yeah, it's all derivative from Nirvana. That was the for me. That was the last big event, and I forgot Radiohead because of course they got a pop singer guy in the band yeah. and he's this good-looking guy, and of course girls like. But I don't. I, I'm, I'm talking about. Oh, I agree with you. Fifteen-year-olds. 15 who can't get into the gig because they're not old enough to, to drink. Yeah. Because all, you, you know what? What really killed rock and roll was when they decided that the only way we could afford to have music was to have a bar. So you immediately got people who only knew you from MTV. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and to that point, too. And they're, and, they're, and they're disappointed when they see you 20 years later, the, the MTV people. They go, oh, shit, what happened to him? Well, he's 20 years older. Yeah, exactly. He's 20 years old. Well, and then, you know, uh, the, the and music can, music can always, music, some music stands the test of time, you know, and you go, oh, I can see why that was a hit. And, and of course, all the Stone stuff, it, it, it's still playable. All of it, even the Mick Jagger solo records. And we didn't even list them as one of the British Invasion Acts, but they were probably the biggest Beatles and the Stones were the two big ones. Yeah. But, and it, but remember, I think they started, all they were doing was American music rehash, remember, with yeah. a bit of enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every one of those, I mean, the, the Beatles' first album had a couple of Motown songs on it. Yep. You know, and they, the, who did they break their first tour? They took uh, uh, Brenda Holloway, and the next one, Mar uh, Mary Wells, they had a girl singer opening for them because they were fans of the Motown thing. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because there's two things that I definitely uh, agree with you with. And to your point, um, one, I think of uh, the idea that all those bands, including yourself, uh, they really they, they dug into the history. They went down the rabbit hole. Uh, you don't see that as much anymore. But to that point, too, I... I wonder when I see modern bands now, uh, if if at all they're successful. But I wonder, like, you know, who am I going to look forward to seeing in thirty years? You know, when you look at the bands now, like like what you're doing, that the songs are still timeless. They're still you still want to go hear them. And I think now, like, who the hell would I want to go see in thirty years? That's that's current, you know. Well, you know, there are a few. There'd be like Echo and the Bunny Man because yeah. because the singer is different from all the other ones you know I call I call it uh, you know when we do a sound check and I and I talk to the sound guy I said please we don't want to sound like Journey we want to sound like a 60s band with overhead mics over the drums make the drums sound like Ringo Starr yeah. not like Journey not like Styx we want to sound like Herman's Hermits and they have no idea what I'm talking about well and the other so, thing and to your point the last thing you want to come across is like a parody of yourself you want to come across as legitimate and original Be anything else than the original because yeah. nobody else dares sing Mrs. Brown. You got a <laughs> you don't you don't see any new bands adding that to their set list in a bar. Yeah, <laughs> it, it doesn't even make a karaoke session. What is um? Yeah. What well, what is it about music? It might be a loaded question, but I mean, you've dedicated your life to to not only music but live performance. What is it that still um triggers something within you that 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 makes you excited and and, and passionate about all this? And lucky, I like my songs. First of all, that's important. You know, I can't imagine being in a band and not liking the songs. And sometimes I go and see, like, a, you know, I'm still a fan of music, other all kinds of music. And I go and see a band and they do like uh, barefooting or something. Like I saw the Who do barefooting, and I go, oh, I wish I was in a band that could play songs like that. Just you know, throw sing songs that we loved and everything. Yeah. But I'm lucky that you know I get a kick out of singing my songs you know because they became my songs and the audience know them and, and so the thing is when, when people say I, I can't do anything else I'm like Keith Richards in a way that we don't know what else to do except what we do yeah yeah you, you know so you, like he said you know we, we'll just keep going until you know until one day you're singing can't you hear my heartbeat and you can't yeah <laughs> and, and